And I think with that, let me uh, introduce Juan Acosta Urquidi, and we're very happy to have him here today. Um, he's spent his man, many, many years, and he uh, has a PhD in uh, cellular uh, uh, neurophysiology, and he's looked at the uh, EEG electroencephalograms, uh, the quantitative versions of it, for many different uh, purposes, and he's had done many, many studies, so he's talking about the EEG correlates of uh, kundalini activation, and I should just read a little bit uh, after uh, his introduction. After 25 years of laboratory basic research in cellular neurophysiology, Dr. Acosta entered the field of QEEG, quantitative in, uh, electroencephalography, in 1996. Initially, he worked with QEEG to test photic and auditory driving responses to mind machines. He then joined an NIH-funded project in alternative medicine at the University of Washington Medical Center, Seattle, to test pulse magnotherapy on neurologic patients suffering from MS. He also pursued research with energy healers at a time when he was initiated as a Reiki master. He has conducted pioneering QEEG and HRV, heart rate variability measurements, with healers, mystics, and shamans. Uh, he's continually charting new territories and uh, learn about all the things that he's doing. Uh, I'm very happy that he is here. So with that, uh, let me just turn it over to Juan. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming on a beautiful Friday evening. Thank you, Mary, for the invitation, and uh, Jerry for the introduction. Uh, <coughs> I have an hour, I hope. Okay, because we started late, huh? Yeah. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Good. No problem. Because I have a, a fair amount of material. That's I'm going to share uh, data and presentations that I've given at conferences in the past. These are PowerPoints and sort of mix it up a little bit so that you get a feeling for what I've been doing these last few years. And uh, I am charting new territory and I definitely need assistance now. <laughs> I'm up to my <laughs> brow in interesting data that needs to be communicated because <laughs> it's groundbreaking stuff. So this is a presentation that I'm going to give at the Science and Non-Duality coming up in October. I've been presenting there for the last uh, five years in a row now. And I love that, that meeting. So bear with me. Uh, what are gamma oscillations? These are the high frequency beta. If you hook up a person to an EEG machine, you can measure these electrical oscillations in their scalp, which are generated by millions of neurons that are all firing synchronously in different areas of the cortex. And they come as different frequency bands. You can think of them as like radio stations, okay? And they all have uh, a specific function. They all have a specific uh, uh, physiology, to, uh, you know, so the lowest Frequencies are now believed to be around 0 0.01 cycle per second, or hertz. Some even claim slower than that. These are very, very slow cortical oscillations. And the very high frequencies tend to top the 100 hertz. That is, uh, these have to be recorded with a technique where you have sensors placed directly over the exposed brain. It's called electrocorticogram because the signals are so small that the bone and the meninges attenuate them. So you need a very, very high impedance, very, very high signal-to-noise ratio equipment to detect these. But with the equipment that I have, you can measure 40 to 60 hertz oscillations quite readily. And so I have uh, terrific software that enables me to measure these things and uh, put numbers to them and compare them. So that's been the 
uh, the tools that I have. All right, so I'm, I'm presently working at submitting a, a big study on the effects of what's called the God molecule. Have you all heard of the God molecule? 5-MeO-DMT? Okay. So I uh, was exposed to this back in 2005. And in 2006, I was in Peru doing ayahuasca uh, conference. And there was an opportunity there to uh, record some data. I had my EEG equipment. So that was the beginning. And I'm in a movie called Aya Awakenings by Rack Razam, the Australian guy. So uh, this is just a comparison of baseline values and then Bufo 5-MeO-DMT. You inhale these uh, crystals. It's a, it's a secretion from the parotid glands of the toad. You'll see pictures of it. And it contains mostly 5-MeO-DMT with trace amounts of other tryptamines as well. Could you stand by the two? Oh, yeah. Sure. Now, what I want to point out here is of all of the effects, the most robust effect as you can see, is in gamma. Look at the values here. These are uh, N of 17 subjects. So gamma is enhanced with these psychoactive substances. Gamma is enhanced with meditation. Gamma is enhanced with Kundalini activation. Gamma is enhanced with feelings of wellness and compassion and love. Uh, I just wrote a chapter on uh, a review of gamma. It's called EG Gamma Oscillations in Healthy Brain, Neuropathology, and Altered States of Consciousness. So I covered a lot of ground there. It's not a newly discovered frequency. It was around in the 1930s. Uh, Oxford University, Adrian, the physiologist there, the first to record gamma in the olfactory cortex of uh, guinea pigs, I believe. But then in the 50s and 60s, when EEG equipment became more sophisticated, more reliable, people started recording gamma and uh, finding correlations with uh, neuropathology, dementia and schizophrenia and autism and so forth. So there's a whole literature on this topic. So this is with the Bufo 5-MeO, and then this is with synthetic 5-MeO, which is a laboratory synthesized high quality. And you get the same effect. You get a big increase in gamma. If we can move over by the podium. <coughs> OK. And then people can see from that, that direction. Okay, the, I think the gamma is not shown here, but it shows the high beta, 25 to 30 hertz. It's, ano it's another slide that shows the increase in gamma. Anyway, trust me, it's a, it's a big, it overpowers all the other effects seen. <coughs> okay. So uh, here's an example of a woman that came into my office lab. <laughs> last year that I met at a Bufo International Conference in Mexico City. And she's able to arouse her kundalini doing a shamanic drumming technique that she's learned. And so she was able to actually produce large EEG oscillations similar to others in kundalini that I've recorded and increase her gamma power. You can see the numbers. 2.1 jumps all the way up to, oh man, this is, this is really tricky. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, uh, that's an example of a EEG with a fast Fourier transform. That's the Frequency analysis is the little plot here at the top. Tells you what frequencies are embedded in these signals. 
And you can see they're all below 10 hertz. 10 hertz is here. So there's a very high delta and theta component account for these big oscillations here. You go from microvolts to millivolts suddenly. You have to dial down the, the gain on your amplifier. So um, she was a very good subject, and uh, we got some really beautiful data. Oh, this is some uh, just comparing, again, uh, BUFO5 and synthetic. G1 stands for gamma 1, 30 to 40. G2 stands for gamma 2, 40 to 50 hertz. So here you can see these increases are quite substantial. Here they're even higher. So what does the gamma state feel like? Mm -hmm. What is she doing? She gets into a multi-orgasmic state that lasts for minutes, which she loves to get into. She she is in a trance, basically. Okay, so she has developed this uh, technique to put her in a deep trance state, where she experiences. Well, you know, she does this as a practice, so she must get something out of it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> she lives in Denver, Colorado, and I just got to see her for a day. So, all right, so these are uh, pictures of some of the subjects, the brave volunteers launching on the 5-MEO DMT. We had a, a very uh, elegant launch pad set up. And then this is at the bottom a woman in Peru who you can see there is having a religious experience after she's had an inhalation of the, of the uh, this is not bufo, this is with plant-based 5-MeO-DMT. So, so these are some of the descriptions that, that, that read what it says on the right. So this is what people report. One of the constants is they, f they feel like they tap into a place of love and complete peace and surrender. All right? So... How, how was that induced? Did you record the gamma rate and then... You, you, have, you, have a subject, you have a subject wearing a cap, as you see there. Okay like you have here with Kika, and you're recording their EEG, and so first you do a baseline. You ask them to sit still for 10 or 15 minutes, and you get a nice recording, hopefully. You have a, a good subject that isn't moving around or, or blinking a lot or having muscle twitches and stuff. So then you have a comparison. You have the, the baseline is the person just resting, eyes closed. They're in the room, they're not in a trance, they're not astral traveling, they're not doing anything fancy. They're just sitting there feeling a little bored. <laughs> <laughs> in a well, people have their techniques to, so to access trance states. Recording, right? No, no, no. You just got subjects that could get themselves... Could elicit, elicit that state. Yes. And, and this is Kika, I'll, I'll get into this a little more, but she's a woman here in Campbell that can bring on her Kundalini activations just through a very light meditation. So she was an ideal subject. Oh, all here? Okay, so these are the, the descriptions of subjects that have had a profound activation with the 5-MeO-DMT, dimethyltryptamine. The other molecule is called just DMT, NNDMT, not to be confused with 5. And that one induces a more visionary type of experience. What does God molecule mean? I didn't coin that word, but it's been around now for about 10 years or so. 
because it puts you into a place where you can experience your divinity. It's a certain brain wave. We have a spiritual brain and we have, we're wired for spirituality and we have what are called God centers in our brain. These keep being studied more and more. There's even a Yale paper recently that found one in the temporal parietal junction, which when stimulated externally can induce feelings of connection to a higher being, a uh, feeling of mystical union, and so forth. So uh, there is a device that I'm going to show a picture of that can help you get to gamma states. There's a whole field of neurofeedback that's exploring gamma and neurofeedback also. Kundalini. Yes, you know, I'm going to start with a different PowerPoint in a minute, and then we'll get into the whole Kundalini thing. But uh, this is this is what I'm going to give in October at Sand, which kind of ties up all the gamma uh, EEG work that I've done and and lists all the previous. EEG work that's also found gamma in these altered states. So lucid dreaming is involved with gamma, okay? And you can trigger lucid dreaming by stimulating uh, subjects with gamma frequencies, transcranial AC stim. That was an important paper. And then Reiki pranic healing. I recently hooked up a woman who does pranic healing. She produced a substantial increase in gamma also. You know, getting into a healing state is getting into a state of love and compassion and surrender and channeling and basically getting out of the way. The first report came from the study of Tibetan monks in 2004 and it's been extended to other uh, <coughs> meditation traditions. Okay, well this is Kika. And uh, I have her book here. And there's a, a little chapter at the end of the book that describes how we did these studies. But I'm going to give you the background of how I got into this. Okay, so... Tantric sex, love, and relation for the modern man. So the last chapter is my work with the EEG. And you can have a look at this book later or pass it, pass it around. Yeah. NNDMT also increases gamma quite substantially. Okay. And then this is the pranic healing meditation that I just previously mentioned. So this was a very nice example of a woman who wanted to be hooked up. She says, I've been doing pranic healing for a few years now. I want to see where I go when I get into my state. And by the way, that's something that I, I, I offer as a service to people. I, I hook people up who want to be tested and want to find out if they're really getting into altered brain states when they access these these dimensions. So she produced a very substantial increase in gamma. Okay. Look at these numbers here. Also alpha, and then we'll review another PowerPoint that shows that healing promotes alpha power increases. All right. So let me uh, get into the other PowerPoint here. <coughs> All right, so now we're going to dive into the Kundalini story. So, uh, 2010, 2011, I'm working in Kansas, Wichita, Kansas, with a colleague helping set up a biofeedback clinic. And I get an email out of the blue saying, are you Dr. Juana Costa Urquidi, who has done work with healers? Uh, we have an interesting... Uh, 
project for you. If you're willing, go to this website, check it out. It's a, uh, a meditation master from South India, Paramhansa Nithyananda, who was quite young in, at the, in those days, who is visiting New Jersey and is open to being brain mapped by you. Would you be interested? Sure. So, Anne, my colleague, and I flew out to New Jersey and we were hosted by this lovely lady. We were uh, in the company of the Swami for three days and his handlers. He was uh, teaching courses and, and doing his meditation retreats. But he was available to do brain mapping. So I got my first recordings of this uh, wonderful yogi. And then I had an opportunity to get some more in Houston later and in Seattle. So I have a file of all the states that he transits through as he goes into meditation and then into a samadhi state. So this is what I gave last year at Sand. And how did I... Uh, so that opened the door for an invitation to go to India in 2011 to record some more Kundalini activation at Swamiji's ashram outside of Bangalore, Bidadi, India. So I arrived there with my EG equipment, and you're going to see the, the hall and all that. And uh, I was able to get data from four subjects, and then we stopped because there were some issues with, with uh, non-disclosure agreements and all this and that, but I got the data. So... Uh, if you start to look for physiological correlates of Kundalini, you're going to find there's very little that is actually known for certain. There's a lot of speculation. There's some very esoteric kinds of studies that come out of India and, and the Far East. And uh, even EEG studies, some of them are, are not very credible. And so you end up with, well, what is going on? You know, because you meet people that have had kundalini activations at some point in their life, and they describe them as life-changing events. And they can last for years, and sometimes not all positive. They, they go through a sort of dark period of the soul, depression, and so forth. So... Um, this is my diving into the literature and trying not to get too bogged down with all the esoteric uh, kundalini writings and all that because you, you can just get lost in that world. Huh? The psychophysiology is not yet fully described, okay? So the present EEG studies explore neural correlates and provide objective validation of a profound and transformative subjective experience. So it's recorded as a high voltage discharge of delta and theta brain waves, followed by increased beta and gamma power. Subjects report ecstatic multi orgasmic experience lasting tens of minutes following the initial discharge. All right. So this uh, takes us into an area that is now termed neurophenomenology. It's a fancy word, but what it means is that you can actually correlate brain states with subjective states. Okay, so take an example, pain, <laughs> which I'm experiencing now because I'm on this medication. Um, your brain shows signatures that it's experiencing pain and your body's reporting pain and your psyche is suffering from the pain experience, and it's all one body-mind experience, you know. Now, in the case of, of drugs, psychoactive drugs, there you have a very clear example, because you can give somebody a substance that has a profound effect on their subjective experience, on their perception, you know, their, their cognitive processes and all that, and you can see changes happening in their brain. 
So the brain's got to do something. It's got to got to play a role in this. And now we're learning what areas of the brain are involved and how that is all playing out. And this has come mostly from work on psychedelic brain science. Okay? So this is just uh, taken from, from texts, the energy channels. Um, you know, it's a fire that rises from the base of the spine and it circulates. And people that describe kundalini activations often describe it as moving up the spine in stages, sometimes getting stuck in some places rather than others. Others don't experience it quite that way. They experience it as warmth, uh, sweating, uh, faintness. Uh, what I can tell you is that it's a real physiological phenomenon. I've heard the description. It's a spiritual electrocution. <laughs> <laughs> and, and from the EEG records, it really does look like, like a seizure disorder. I mean, these are large amplitude oscillations recorded in the brain, yeah. So it, it's, this is like putting readings on subjective experiences. Have you noticed the readings between like what would be considered pain and pleasure like similar? Have you actually looked at like the correlations between what parts of the brain are maybe activating during this pleasure state? And no, that's all work that has to be done. I need a team. I need a, I need more tools. I mean, that, there's there's a lot of questions here. Yeah. Could you explain how kundalini energy is out of control? Sure. And what do you, can you just tell us what the process is? You need to work with somebody that knows about kundalini and, and not play around with it. Yeah. Just Yeah. And to not allow those those uh, activations that, that can be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's led some people to suicide, you know. It's, it's not something to play with. Um, now, uh, so Kika, she's a Brazilian-Italian lady who's a tantric teacher. A book is being circulated around, I guess. Uh, had just returned from the same ashram in India that I was invited to in 2011. And so she said, I want to get hooked up and see what I'm doing because I can bring it on pretty much at will. And I thought, wow, that's a terrific subject. Because, you know, you meet people that say, yes, I've had kundalini activations. Well, can you have one? Well, I don't know. It's been a while. It's been years. They come and go. I can't be sure that I can trigger one. And, you know, if you're going to do an EEG reading, you want to have something to record. You can't just, you know, hope that it's going to turn on. Now, these people, uh, some of them know how to turn it on. All right? Okay. So, this is what I saw there. And uh, if You can you can turn on the video if you, if you just uh okay so those are uh very activated uh these are these are uh, kriyas these people are experiencing so you can see the challenges of getting anything that you can record on an EEG when the subject is flopping around and moving and all that. <laughs> but I was able to get some. And they would be given this cue by the Swami on command and they would start this. It was almost like they were conditioned, like they were you know, conditioned to, to initiate this. Uh, this woman here, she's from an L L.A., she basically left her family. She said she didn't want to return because she experiences these multi-orgasmic states several times a week, and she says it's just taking her beyond the beyond, and she doesn't have any need to return to her former life. <laughs> huh? Okay, so, yeah? 
Shaking? No, they're not doing it at will. It's, okay, so it's, it's, like a it's like a seizure that takes over. Wow. Yeah, the first time I saw this was, was here in San Jose at the Vedic temple because the Swami started a temple here. Before I was invited to India, I, I wanted to check out what I'm, what I'm getting into. And I watched these two subjects. Uh, they were watching the TV of the Swami channel, and he came on, and they started immediately. And I thought, my God, this looks like a seizure. But no, it's not a seizure because they don't lose consciousness. They recover quickly. They're not banging into things and hurting themselves, and, you know, just sort of losing it completely. And they spring back and, and, and they, they come right back into room awareness and they can talk about it. So this is real. <laughs> okay, so this is from uh, some of these subjects that I got from data. So you can see here, there's already familiar things. There's these large delta peaks and theta peaks, okay, embedded in the data. Now, you can record many tens of minutes of activation, so you have to choose, pick and choose what you want to record and what you want to uh, emphasize. And now the calibration jumps into uh, millivolts. Where are we? Here we go. So you went from a, a millionth of a volt, microvolt, to a thousandth of a volt because the signals are so big. Okay? So, uh, here you have Kundalini rising can have inherent dangers. The actual experience can cause more damage than good. Ancients speak of the volatility of this heightened energy. A ring of lightning folds a flaming fire. All right, so my take on this, and you know, I'm not a, a spiritual seeker of any particular tradition, although shamanism is my base. I've been doing that for 30 some years is the kundalini is, is the life force energy. This, this, is, this is what is at the core of our soul's being and that it's expressed as sexuality, it's expressed as, uh, you know, uh, these, these corporeal uh, orgasms and loss of self and all of that. And uh, if you tap, if you tap into that, and you know how to manage it and control it, you're sitting on the power switch of your body. So that's a very powerful thing to to have. And then this is Kika, and she. You can see the look of pleasure. On, on her face. Where are we now? Boy, these things are. I think she actually starts talking here. Give, give, give it a minute or so. <laughs> well, I'm going to advance so that we get through some of the other material. Uh, these are Kika's EEG signals. You can see there's the big delta peak and the theta peak. Isn't that nice to see some reproducible signals across different people? at different times that are all experiencing some of the same things. Those are, they're all uh, two to three hertz delta and four to five theta. Yeah. 
ओके एंड देन दिस इज सम मोर डेटा ऑफ दिस लेडी लिन यू कैन सी द the colors here uh this is different software but that's her baseline alpha nice robust alpha and now look at uh red is theta and wine color is delta so these are the major peaks now showing up alpha is down okay So shamanic induced trance states also involve kundalini activation showed remarkable similar patterns during kriyas these electrophysiological data demonstrate the physical expression physiological reality of the kundalini energy moving through a human body and help to demystify this phenomena so this is a, a beginning this is just a start more studies have to be done but uh they're feasible now i'm going to show you some of the earlier stuff that i've done with healers because uh that's probably where a lot of you come in and let me just take a quick survey how many in this room are practicing energy healers okay yeah and what modalities do you use primarily tantric uh pranic reiki therapeutic touch brennan technique yes uh there's many okay so and then let's just go to uh start the slide show from where it is from the beginning okay so this is a talk that i gave at the academy of intuition medicine uh some years ago and we actually hooked up a, a healer there and uh try to get some data but it wasn't he wasn't a good subject he was he was very uh nervous and kept jumping around so the quality of the data wasn't any good ah come on make this move what do you feel is the significance of your measuring these well i'm a neuroscientist and and i like to know what's going on in the brain and i have tools to measure the electrical activity of the brain which is a major thing that they provide information about how your brain is shifting its operations during these sub powerful subjective experiences in other words if you didn't see anything happening in the brain it would be a little bit disappointing right i mean all of our perceptions actions all our cognitive processes have a signature in our brain the brain now is understood to operate through neural networks that are all entangled in you know talking to different areas of the brain that are distributed spatially so we have a neural network for pain for addiction okay for sleep disorders for attentional disorders for anxiety for depression for memory this is all becoming understood now okay This is that's your department. It is my department. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm just curious if it show like when you're looking at the brain waves like when Can you repeat the question? Can you speak up a little bit? Question. Oh, okay. Thanks. The question is in a state of activation, kundalini acti activation, is there incisive research now showing that the potential for 
uh, full orgasmic energy or, or full body orgasm or sexual activation being actually measurable as potential for healing rather than, let's say, drugs or um, you know, Reiki, can you actually use? Sure, well, it's the oldest known drug to humans, you know, is sex, you know. Right. After <laughs> after trauma, <laughs> that's what I'm like. <laughs> well, there are there are labs that that are studying you know pleasure centers of the brain and correlating with with different subjective states and all that, but uh, none that are addressing kundalini or or things like DMT that, that I know of. This is all very new. Yeah. Okay, so this is from my shamanic background. These are. Uh, a group healing, a circle dance over there, 10,000 year old from uh, North Africa, yeah. Shamans of prehistory. So uh, having a group in enhance the healing potentiates the effects of the healing. And this has been known to cultures for 40,000, 50,000 years, you know. So you create a field effect. Okay? So I've been wor working really, my interests have been in the interface of science and spirituality. And energy healing is a pretty good place to look because all of the healers have some spiritual connection. And some of them can articulate it very nicely. So uh, what, you, what you get when you ask them, what are you actually doing a typical answer is, I'm just getting out of the way. <laughs> I'm just being a channel for divine source, for universal healing energy, for Watantanka, you know, great spirit, for Christ energy, for, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, Tao, Taoist healing energy. I've met some people who work that way. Some people just call themselves spiritual healers. Okay, so uh, this is the god of therapeutics, Asclepios. Okay, so this is just a little side effect, uh, a little side story on EEG. The discoverer of EEG was a psychiatrist named Hans Berger during uh, the war years in Germany. And he had a a terrifying experience as a young soldier where he was almost killed by uh, a battery, uh, a wheel that was pulling an artillery gun in the mud. And at that point he had this epiphany that somehow his father and a sister knew about his plight. In other words, he was interested in telepathy. And that was the seed that got him to explore whether it was possible to record anything from a from a brain that reflected you know uh, telepathy so he designed the first EEG system with galvanometers and all that this is in the 1930s mm -hmm. and published in, in subsequent years and first recorded the alpha alpha rhythm okay 1924, actually, yeah. So earlier, 1929 was the first publication. Different traditions, uh, shamanic. Okay, so the present study asked the question, do energy healers from different modalities shift their brain state during the act of healing compared to a control baseline? Okay, do the clients receiving the healing treatment? So now I've also hooked up clients receiving energy healing. And bingo, what do you see there? Their alpha power also goes up. So there's some kind of a resonant effect that's taking place. Okay? So I want to do more of those kinds of experiments because they're, they're really uh, amazing, you know? So um, the main effect was with the gamma, the alpha, alpha power is potentiated 
You know, alpha is the dominant brainwave frequency when you just sit relaxed and close your eyes. When you open your eyes, you, uh, <coughs> you suppress gamma. I mean alpha. We're talking about alpha now. So alpha is associated with just uh, turning your attention inward. Okay? But it's not just the meditation or relaxation frequency. It's involved in in memory and in many cognitive processes. It's, it's had a second look in the last 20 years or so. So alpha is very important, very powerful. People with head injuries often don't produce much alpha. They have lesions in their alpha. Head concussions and, and mild traumatic brain injuries. Yeah, I've seen that quite consistently, yeah. This is a, a Native American uh, Apache shaman I hooked up, and he's also doing healings on other people. And so we did some uh, healer comparison, baseline versus healing, and you can see that the maps look different. When was this done? These are called coherence maps. When was it? When was this done? Yeah. Uh, this was done about 2010. Roughly, yeah. Right. More recently, I've, I've, I've done a few, but you know, I've accumulated so much data, I need to write this up and get it out there and publish it. So coherence maps are very valuable because they show correlated activity across different sites of the cortex. So when you have more correlated activity, it means you're activating new pathways. Okay, your networks are expanding. And this is what you see with, with DMT. So we, we had some fun uh, playing with this and making maps. Increased power in, uh, in alpha. And then in the client. We also see some, some changes. Notice the phase lag in this case is increased. This is a measure of connectivity, of efficiency of communication between different sites in the brain. Okay, Reiki. Uh, this is me, actually. I, I'm a Reiki uh, master. And I can elevate my alpha power when I'm doing Reiki and I can elevate it in somebody receiving Reiki from me. So those are things that we can explore in a workshop, but a workshop is complicated because I only have one or two pieces of equipment, you know. It's not something we can, we can all do. We can, we can do like demonstrations. That's, that's a so here's an example of uh, a Reiki uh, large increase, 84% increase. You see the, the peak alpha here. The scale is now different than here. <coughs> and this a client receiving Reiki also shows an increase in alpha. Okay. Here's somebody doing uh, Qigong. Basically, I think that what the healers are, they're all doing the same thing. <laughs> you know, mentally, <laughs> they, they, will, they will convince you that their healing modality is, is, is the best or this or that or the oldest or the most efficient and everything. But when you hook them up to an EEG and you compare them all, they, they're all showing similar patterns. And this is not surprising because they describe it as getting out of the way, getting into a state of compassion and feeling more love, which would put you in, in a gamma state for sure and in an alpha state. In other words, you're dialing down your, your ego awareness, your default mode network. This is a theta healer that also is a very powerful healer. She gets into theta states. This is Richard Bartlett, the quantum doctor, and he produces large surges in gamma. Yeah. 
I used to live in Seattle, so I, I got to hang out with Richard and visit him and go to his, his clinic and watch him work and all that. Uh, matrix energetics, you know, gamma bursts during healing state is what HS means. Okay, now this is the, uh, the Swami. So when the Swamiji is in a meditation state, he produces more beta. So he's actually channeling. Okay, his alpha goes up some. That's his alpha. More of this color than in this map. But this now shows up, which was, was not here before. So, and then I was able to catch the samadhi state. That's Swamiji Nithyananda, recorded in, uh, in Seattle. 2011. These are just, uh, they're called topographic brain maps, and they, they increase, the, they indicate the power values. So low is blue, high is pink. So whenever you see pink lighting up, it means there's more activity in those frequency bands. So look at his beta went up. And there's his little beta peak, that little green peak that shows up there now. So what he's doing is, is he's channeling. And then when he gets into a healing state, there's a, a robust increased alpha power. So similar to all the other <laughs> healing modalities. Excuse me, I have a, a hiccups. This is a shaman that can also increase his uh, alpha power. Peruvian shaman. This is a Mazatec Indian shaman from Oaxaca who also increased her alpha power. Okay. This is a Diksha healer that I worked with in Santa Cruz who was doing a whole study for her thesis, for her graduate degree. So we recorded a, quite a number of Diksha healers. And, and so look at her alpha. These are, these are called difference maps where you subtract the baseline. So whenever you see blues, this means less than. Whenever you see reds, this means more than the, ba the baseline. So the one that lights up Strongly is the alpha band. A Buddhist monk. A baseline is, is if I have you simply wear the EG cap and sit quietly and record your activity for 10 minutes with eyes closed, not doing anything, not, not meditating, not, not healing, not, not channeling, not doing anything fancy, just sitting there <laughs> contempl contemplating your, your belly button. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are you collecting data about whether or not healing actually occurs? Well, how do you, how do you collect that data? Well, I, I, so we know what's going on with that person, and we're calling it healing. But well, they, they, they report that they're accessing their healing state. So the practitioner says, this is the familiar place that I go to when I'm interacting with, with my clients. Now, whether they get a healing from that, that's a whole different research. You have to follow that up. You have to follow that up. You need a history of the client. <laughs> Excuse me. You need, uh, you need a team of people to, to, to do that kind of research. We're just looking, we're just looking at, 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 at a neuroscience uh, EEG correlates because that's what I, I know how to do and I can do it quite well. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, visualization also increases alpha. Okay. So this is the overall results. And so here you have the baseline, 
the healing state, okay, with these are the practitioners that get into the alpha state. <coughs> Their alpha power goes way up. And then you have the receiving healing. And then you have a group of healers that are called the sham healers. And these are, oh, for the hiccups. You know, maybe. <laughs> and so sham healing is a bit complicated, but basically you recruit people that are not healers <laughs> or that don't claim to be healers. And you ask them to pretend <laughs> that they are doing a healing on a subject. And what you see there is you see no, no significant increases in alpha. So clearly the, the people who have training as healers have some access to modifying their brain. So why are this is uh, microvolt? Mean alpha po power and absolute uh, microvolt square, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are the statistical tests that the graph was based on. The sham healing condition, there was, there was even a decrease in peak alpha. Conclusions, okay. So you can read these. There's a common physiological state accessed by all the diverse healers studied. And these are consistent with the mechanism of resonance between the healer and the client. So this is, this is something that's talked about a lot in, in healing, in sound healing, that you enter into a, a resonance state with the client. I mean, this is what good doctors do. <laughs> um, home, home visits, you know, it's part of the placebo effect. You connect, you connect with your client. Good therapists do this too. They have that ability to, to enter into a sort of a resonant state with their with their clients. Have you, um, Seth Labs over here, have you measured remote healing? Oh yes, uh, two examples of it. A woman from Seattle sent a remote healing to a client in Santa Cruz, and we arranged to have this done by phone. And she wasn't going to tell me when it, w it was going to happen. She just said, start recording, and in the, ne in the next 10 minutes or so, I'll be sending a healing. And we did see a, a little increase in alpha. In both the, heal the healer and the healing? No, she was in Seattle doing her healing. Mm -hmm. I was in Santa Cruz with the client wearing the cap. So I recorded the, the subject. Okay. Yeah. But it would be nice... These experiments have been done. There, there's, there's a literature on, uh, you know, shared EEG signals between a sender and a receiver, even under conditions of blocking out all EMF signals and and uh, with with uh, visually evoked poten potentials. I know. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would like to do a lot of this stuff, but I need a team to do this, and you need, you need funding and resources. Yeah, my experience with the healers is that he, the healing tends to be more powerful if it's up close. Uh, touching is preferable to being at, at a distance, and then uh, some people can can produce effects in the room. Some people can produce effects at a distance. There's a woman in, Austra in Australia who wants to do a, an experiment with me. She's a well-known healer there, and she wants, wants me to hook up someone here and then arrange to have her send a healing <coughs> long distance. <laughs> there are, there are ma many, many studies, EEG studies. I know some of the people that have been to prisons and that have hooked up psychopaths and sociopaths and serial killers and all of it. And yes, there are differences in their brains and in their anatomy and physiology. No? 
I think the most exciting stuff has been coming out of the <coughs> psychedelic brain science where they've used fMRI machines to track the activity of the default mode network. Is everyone familiar with, with that? The DMN? Gosh, I have slides of that. I don't know if we have time for that. But basically, your, uh, the network that receives the most metabolic energy and has the most traffic in your brain in a resting state, you're not tasking. You're just simply hanging out. It's called the default mode network. And it's a collection of, of cir circuits that are connecting frontal and posterior regions of the brain with paralimbic sites, okay? Deeper sites in the limbic system. And this is where your ego consciousness resides. When you dial down the activity of the DMN, you lose uh, your, e your ego awareness. And this happens when you smoke the DMT. That's why it's called the God molecule, because you get out of being, being Juan or Penny or Jack. You now drop into a, a different room where you experience yourself as a soul consciousness, as an older, deeper source of, of divine consciousness. And it's a place of love. Sounds cheesy, but that's how most peop so people report what, what describing it. 5-MeO-DMT. The slides at the very beginning, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine. It's a chemical that's made by us. It's in our brains and in our peripheral tissues. So, with, mm -hmm. uh, who was experiencing this so much that she just left her family. Or maybe it wasn't Brazil. Maybe in India, 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 huh? In India. That she just left her family right. to do this. And <laughs> I, I mean, I would, my question would be, Okay, so we can achieve this state, but then... What are you going to do with what, it? What are we going to do with it? I mean, right. isn't there an obligation of consciousness? No. No? <laughs> oh, I want to hear more about that. Fuck no. <laughs> that, that. Those are the questions to ask those people that are having those experiences. You know, uh, I don't think it would be a good idea to have Kundalini activation all the time. All right, so th this is what I'm referring to as the DMN, default mode network. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are all studies that have come out of meditation. Now it's called contemplative neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Contemplative neuroscience. Yes, yes, yes. Stanford is getting, in, is getting into it now, too. So, um, these are talks that have been g given at the SAND conference also in, in the past years. So basically, you d dial down the activity of those little hot spots in these parts of the brain. Okay. And those are the ego spots? And the ego dissolved. Okay. Okay, so these are... Uh, little diagrams, these are graph, made from graph theory, mathematical tools. So we have these hubs, okay, and these are very rich locations where there's a lot of traffic converging from different brain networks. And when those hubs get modified, you experience yourself in a completely different way. So the, the latest, I was at the World Ayahuasca Conference in Spain just last month, and there was a talk there by a group from London. They've now shown that uh, NNDMT also dials down the default mode network, as does ayahuasca. Yeah. Is your voice that yes, the default mode network is suppressed by psychedelics, psilocybin, LSD, um, ayahuasca, 
in the in, in DMT. In meditation. Meditation. You need 10,000 hours of meditation to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to start to uh, I- impact that. Although there are studies now that after six weeks of mi- mindfulness training, they can detect changes in, in the brain, actual morphometric ch- changes. There are studies that are showing this. So, uh, you know, maybe you don't need 10,000 hours. Responsibility for consciousness. Do you know much about our session in this thing? So, Warren measured me two years ago. Oh, yeah. Took me up in a lab. Second time I've been measured. And I've hidden most of what I've done for most of my life. Okay. Can you stand up and talk? Yeah, can you? Can uh, you sure. Why not? All here? And I, I've hidden most of what I've done for most of my life. And, and for a lot of reasons, because social acceptance is tricky when when people think you're different. He looked me up and told me some things that I didn't know. I never, it was the second time I've been up. First time with Jeffrey Fan. okay? And Fan said, so, would you say you're a healer? And I felt outed and, and <coughs> verified the same thing. He goes, well, you have the same EEG profile as the study of 59 known healers that it took a year and a half then. Okay. 59? Okay. Yeah, 59. Who did this? Jeffrey Fan. Oh, I don't know who uh, he works a lot with Joe Spencer. Oh, I went, okay, that was all very promising, and he asked me a lot of questions. Tell me last stuff I didn't know about my, how I run my mind. Uh-huh. When I sat with Juan Sophia, I thought to myself, well, if Fan said that, maybe I can train my brain to do stuff that I want to do. <laughs> and so Juan said to me, well, let's look under the hood. The hood's not. And three or four things that I remember that were really interesting was, one, he said there wasn't much difference between my baseline and my oh, yeah. meditative state, which I was surprised at, but it sort of makes sense. He also said I run a theta alpha peak at 7.8 hertz, oh, okay. like Bill Benson. Nice. You yeah, have that. That's the, the, uh, the Schumann resonance frequency. And he also said something kind of surprised me. He said you run your theta and alpha in front of your head. Uh, okay. And you said most people run it back here, right? Alpha should be ex- Expressed mostly at occipital sites, okay. parietal occipital sites. Frontal alpha is correlated with, with uh, high pole perfusion, attentional disorders. It's, it's, one of, it's one of the uh, it's one of the markers for ADHD actually. That's right. That's right. Markers for ADHD. The markers for ADHD, attentional oh, deficit hyperactivity disorder. So so. I have Korea. I have Kundalini Russians. Um, the last time I had one Kundalini Russia, I really had to be careful of. I knew it was happening. It was 2013. I was thinking about something I was very fond of. I was very fond of that. I landed and I started to ride. And it hurt my head and I just stopped this. I think I told you about that. What was that, right? So Korea is actually a common thing for the twitching. Yeah. It's around people that I'm fond of. Okay. You know, I don't know how to explain it then. And, and the first time actually the dream turn was in 2013, standing with the Zen bikini I was very fond of. She was us. Okay. So the woman the woman that was that left her family, when you look at my life, I've kind of done that too. And and my wife and I had a kid. He's a happy guy, he's productive, and I went, why am I doing what I'm doing? I'm doing somebody else's life. I left Southern California, I came up here. I'm like, I'm out of here. And, and it was about me deciding to be who I, I felt I should be. Did I feel a responsibility to heal people? No. No, I don't feel a responsibility. Sometimes I can help them. So, so the kind of things he's describing, I can do some of those things. I don't feel like I'm magical, okay? So, so there's, I don't think I told you about this. There's a guy that I used to know named Frank. Frank's in his 70s. He was cleaning a friend's garage one day. And I came home that night, and Frank had a trolley horse right here. And I liked this guy. And he didn't know what I could do. And this is a baby thing for, 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 for Jewish to do. I said to him, without thinking, do you want me to fix it? And, oh, that's showtime, right? And I can be quite profane, so I'm, I'm dialing it down. And about 
30 seconds later, he goes, Michael came out, what do we do? Okay, so Frank will lay on the sofa, face down, and I can see what's going on with the legs, that seat feel and stuff. And, and go mentally to your favorite place, mountains, ocean, wherever that is. Just go there. And I put one hand um, on his lower back and one hand right above his knee, and in 20 seconds, it's starting to go away. And he's in the of this yet. I can see it. I can feel it. And in two minutes, it's gone. And he gets up, he's glassy-eyed, and he's gone. He's, he's in a, into a very relaxed state. He goes, what did you do? I said, well, it's guiding me. I don't know what to do. So, so a lot of us can do this. Probably at least two other people in this room could do this. And all it is is, is like he said, getting out of your way. Yeah. And, and it's, it's the strangest thing. You have to surrender who you think you are to become that person that, that moves that around. It's not me doing it. Okay, it's me being, uh, I hate the word, right? Me being a child. So I had such a strong reaction to that woman, what you said about that woman. I don't have a responsibility to anybody. I'm responsible to be happy and love people. That's what I have. So I identify with the fact that she left her family. That was really difficult. And I basically did that. Okay? And, but it was a mutual leaving. So she is probably in her own way doing things that she wouldn't do otherwise. So that's really good for everybody. And that consciousness transfers to everybody else. It's like when you're in the presence of somebody that's really good for you, it's that. And, and because she's happier, Everybody's happy. There's a field effect. And, and there are people who do healings across an ocean. The one, one woman one, one day that, that um, was looking for a place to live for me in the Hague, and an offer over there, a job offer. And <clears throat> it's 10.30 at night, and it's early in the morning, her time, and soon I should wake up and talk to her on Skype. So I talked to her, and she was trained by Tita Shoka's people. <clears throat> And she, uh, she said, well, I'm not going up this, this, this early, but my arms bother me. And I said, can I meditate with you? We meditated for about 10 minutes, and we stopped. And, and she's the first one that spoke. She was going to ask you if you did. Sure. Were you sitting next to me? Yes. Were you sitting behind me? Yes. Were you working on my arm? Yes. She knew exactly what I did. I never had anybody do that. And I said, you feel better? Yeah. Now, in her case, she wasn't ready to, to, to like, be done with that thing. And I'm not that practice at it that I want to offer that kind of thing to everybody. It was more like I felt a very strong bond with her. So the kind of things he's talking about, that's why I wanted to sit with him. I wanted to wait. If I can do that, it didn't run in my brain good. So this... This guy, Fannin, who works with Joe Spangle, said that I run Delta and, and Theta at two and three standard deviations beyond normal. So this guy can show you stuff like that in your own brain. And I haven't seen him for a while, two years now. Um, he, say, he came to our house one time about four years ago. We had Russell Park there, and he monopolized Russell's time. <laughs> I got a picture of him snoozing on a cat next to Russell. <laughs> yeah. You know, we should, we should do more sessions, huh? I'd be okay. interested in that. If there's something I can help you with, man, I don't know. Like well, I want to see that delta. I, I didn't see that. Did you, you know? that well, you know, people say, okay, the EG, is it different in the morning than in the afternoon? If I hook you up tomorrow, are we going to see the same results? And by and large, your brain state is pretty conserved. I had to prove it to myself. I had a client that I mapped four different times in the space of two months, and the maps were almost all identical. If you lay them out and showed them to somebody that didn't know what it was about, they would match them correctly. I would like to talk about some of the theogenic states. Yeah, yeah. But the, the other point that you make is important is when there's a connection, the empathic connection promotes healing. That's, that's, that's a given. That's always been like that. Right? I mean, and you have that with your therapist. You have that with your family practitioner. Your, 
You have that with your dog. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I have not tried that. That would be interesting thing to to try. Yeah. <laughs> meditate, meditate, meditate. Um, Do breathing and you bring it up your spine and get down same your spine. dance in circles. Prana, pranayama, breathing. <laughs> breathing. There, there's whole, lots I mean, you of can different find mold, it on mold. the internet, probably. Yeah. The, the breathing exercise, but you need the help of. There's a wonderful book on the Kundalini um, that I saw in a books in this metaphysical bookstore in Carmel that's just recently come out on how to control the Kundalini and what are the dangers and how to use it for benefit. It's written by a woman. Probably you could find it on the internet. Its recent book has come out. What's the name of the book? Or the author? Or the author? <laughs> I don't have it in my brain, but I have a feeling you could find it because it's, it's a new book. I may have those books here. Now, this one is a particularly interesting book because uh, this is a woman that had, she's from New Zealand, I think. And she had a Kundalini awakening that changed her life when she was in her teens. And she has spent the rest of her adult life trying to understand what happened to her. So that book is full of uh, all these hypotheses about biochemical changes and endocrine changes and at that level. But uh, a lot of it is really just her, her ideas and suggestions of places to look. But can you read no the authors? Of yeah, I can. We can't read the author. Uh, can you read what it? are the author's names? The one at the left is Jana. Jaina Dixon. How do you spell Dixon? Dixon. D I X O N. Jaina Dixon. Okay. Hello. See, when I saw biology of Kundalini, I jumped and oh, that's just what it is. How about Awakening Kundalini? Who's the author? That one is a uh, collection of essays by edited by a number of people. Then Henry Newberg is featured there. Uh, it's not focused in it. Anyway, just Kundalini rising. You can get it on Amazon. And what is that author? Can you read the author? I can't read the, the thing. Oh. I have to go to that thing. What is the first? What's the name of the first book? Now, there's a, a slide which I was looking for. I thought I had it in it. There's a device called a Bylight, which delivers infrared light to the scalp. You wear this headset. And it also delivers infrared to a nasal probe, which is clipped onto the nose. And I have some friends who have these devices, and they have them deliver pulses at 40 hertz. So they're inducing gamma. OK? So there are now neural stimulation tools out there, neural meditation tools, if you wish, that can uh, access some of these states, or at least give you a taste of what they might feel like. I use audiovisual stimulation, goggles with LEDs and, and sound. There's lots of gamma sound, you know, by all of these types, types of materials. Yeah. I like another book that's been out for a while, Dr. Lee Sanella. Oh, yes. Yeah. What is it, Lee? How do you spell that? Um, I think it's S A N N E L A. L -A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's Kundalini's Transcendence or Psychosis. I think yes, yes. a lot of people that came to emergency rooms yes. and yes. described the adverse 
Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I have that book and I read it a long time ago. It was uh, <coughs> referred to me by Dr. Groff, Stanley Groff. Yeah. The LSD, LSD researcher, yeah. That book by Dolphin Christian. Yeah, there's, that's, that's one of the sources. So if you, if you dive into the esoteric literature, you're going to find quite a few books by Indian sages and mystics. And most of them, to me, are incomprehensible, you know. I mean, they require really delving into a whole system of, of philosophy and thought, and <laughs> I don't have that inclination. My, my work is more science and, and, sp and spirituality, measuring things. I like to measure things. Well, I have a neurofeedback practice. I have cards to give out, by the way. Yeah, so I work with people who have issues, who don't want to do medication. And I do uh, brain training with neurofeed neurofeedback equipment mm -hmm. based on a map. Yeah, yeah. So you use different recordings of brain states and somehow Well, it's more complicated than that, but there's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of tools out there. Neurofeedback's been around for more than 40 years, so now it's at its golden age because of the advances in techno technology and new equipment and, and, and 21st century brain science. It, it's all getting connected up to that, yeah. Yeah, but you can learn... There's a, a fellow that runs the Neuromeditation Neuro Institute. Okay. I think he's going to be coming through here in October. How does somebody work with you? Like, say, somebody here wants to, like, get their scans done. Yeah. They pay you to do that. Yes. They fund you for studies. Then they well, yes. Let me give out cards. And, and, and I'm uh, open and will willing to do a brain map assessment. I'm in Marin, but I, I travel. I can, I can come to your home, your office, your clinic. And, uh, you know, brain map will take an hour, hour and a, hour and a half, roughly. Have you ever had uh, experience with that light machine that you have to use that is from the Worcester one? Oh, yeah. And uh, what was the effects? Uh, it produces very robust photic <laughs> entrainment. Driving. It what? Eric, photic entrainment. If if I if I give you flickering lights, mm -hmm. these produce signals in your brain at a frequency which follows the light frequency. What does that do? For it can ch help you change your brain state. It can oh, help if you're you agitated. if you're agitated. It can help you sleep. Oh, it can okay. it can help you get. <laughs> It can help you get more activated. It can help you get more relaxed. So this is this is my neurofeedback car, and then the other one is yeah here. Those are the other DMT ones here. Yeah. A lot of information. Right?